Hello there, I'm Carl, and I've got here a Stormcast miniature uh, for my Age of Sigmar army uh, Stormcast that I've been collecting. And I'm going to be painting him up today, and I wanted to take you guys along with me on this process to kind of show you how I paint. Um, and you can kind of take what you will off of it for your own painting endeavors. And uh, if there's anything you're curious about or questions you have for my process, leave them down in the comments, and I'll get to them. Uh, to get started, I want to go over my tools that I'm going to be using. I'm actually selecting a very limited scope of tools and paints uh, because this is kind of an entry-level tutorial um, for you guys. So we're just going to go over them quickly. Um, first is my paints. This might not seem like an entry-level amount of paint, but it's actually a set of paints plus some other things. So I've got this nice little 3D printed caddy and a light, nice little basket here full of my paints, and they're facing up. You're going to note that some of these paints are uh, actually primed and painted to give the indication of what the paint looks when it's dried. And these new ones that aren't are actually just brand new paints from a game color set from Vallejo. Uh, the Vallejo game color set is essentially a copy of the game's workshop paint set. So these are going to have um, copies or essentially uh, equivalents of the game's workshop line of paints. Some of these though are not actually Games Workshop uh, varieties of paints. Some of them are actually Army Painter shades. Uh, this is a blue tone. Uh, these are essentially very thin paints um, that uh, you can apply and thin out in order to, to flow into recesses that's referred to as washing. For my Stormcast, which have purple cloaks, I'm gonna be using two paints that aren't included in this set. A heavy violet from the game color Extra Opaque. Uh, this is a, a paint that essentially has extra pigment added to it so it's very very dense and has really really easy coverage this is going to be my coverage paint for my cloaks so it's easier to cover them and paint them and then my blue violet is going to be my highlight color for those cloaks one thing to note though um one of the reasons why i do paint on the bottoms of my pots and kind of display them in these upright caddies is that when paint dries it dries a darker and less saturated than it is when it's wet um, so this bright yellow, it's going to darken down, and it's also going to be transparent. All acrylic paint is essentially, in some level, transparent. Um, and you're going to find, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, things like coverage during this uh, video, where I'll say something has good coverage or not. What I mean by that is that a paint is less transparent than another type of paint. So that's a lot to take in, I know. Don't worry about it. Paint isn't actually that complicated. But you're going to find out when you actually work with it. It's quite simple. So moving on from that, my brushes are the next important thing that I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using a set of brushes. This is actually a lot. This is three three sets of one type of brush. It's a, a Royal and Land Nickel set. They come in these plastic handled brushes. They're about $13 uh, each set. I have three of them because I like to have duplicates of these larger brushes. Uh, over time, what you'll end up doing is buying fancier brushes. Uh, probably when you want to invest a lot of money in these hobbies, where those, a set of those for 11 brushes is about $13. This brush is about $15 by itself. So it's, a, it's essentially the same cost as all those brushes. And it looks kind of bad when you, it's not wet, but once I wet this Kalinsky brush down, you can see how its point goes to a really fine tip. Um, this guy I'm not going to be using today, unfortunately. I love using this brush. I've painted dozens and dozens of miniatures with it, and it's still in perfect condition because I do take care of it. Next up um, is my palette. So this is my wet palette. Essentially, it's a piece of uh, parchment paper, dollar store parchment paper, really cheap stuff, um, on top of a, a membrane that acts as a water reservoir. This is just a piece of like microfiber dishcloth from a dollar store. And essentially it's loaded with water. Um, what I'll be doing is I'll be adding water to my paint to uh, get it to the right consistency. So, it, so it, one, loads to the brush easily. So I don't have to kind of scoop the paint out with the brush. And two, flows from the brush onto the surface nicely and smoothly. And that's just going to live off here. And when I do mix paints, I'll bring it back onto on a screen. I'm going to be working with metallics today. And when you uh, work with metallics, you'll find that as you rinse the metallics off, uh, you're gonna deposit metallic flake inside your water. I have a, a little clip here recorded where I've swirled some water, uh, some silver paint into one of these cups here. And you can see that the, the metallic flakes in there form a essentially a cloud of very dense, like really bright little uh, points. And those can actually work their way into your paints that are non-metallic if you don't separate your rinse cups. So one rinse cup is for your strong, is for your um, you know your reds, your blues, your greens, and one is for your gold, your silvers, your metal, your gunmetals. Oh, and an absolute last thing I'm going to be using is makeup sponges. These are cheap. You can find them at dollar stores, and I'm going to be using this pair of scissors that I've been gesturing with uh, in order to cut these into appropriate shapes. We're going to go all over that when we get to the cloak, which is going to be using these guys as a tool to do nice, easy highlights. 
Okay, so we're gonna get started working on the base coats for this guy here. And I'm gonna be starting with metallics because I'm gonna have a few tricks that I'm gonna use to really punch up the metallics on this guy. Uh, and in order to, to save time, I wanna do the metallics first because those tricks are a little messy. Um, I've primed this guy in medium gray here, but I'm gonna give him a quick dry brush just to demonstrate the technique and also to kind of pick up some details for you guys. So I'm gonna be using some of my dead white here for this dry brush. The technique for dry brushing is to take a dry brush that's completely not loaded with any water uh, and load it with some sort of uh, pigment that's not thinned whatsoever and then try to wipe as much of it off as possible. So the way, what we're doing here essentially is we're kind of taking a very thick paint and we're going to deposit that on the raised areas uh, and why I'm doing this is just to pick these details up for the camera. Now that we've picked out some detail here, so it's a easier, little easier for you guys to see how I'm working, I'm gonna mix up my first coat of paint. So um, I want to have a very dark gunmetal as my base coat, because I wanna dry brush on some silver on top of it, uh, like I showed here, and make it really pop and sing. The issue that I'm gonna run into is that this isn't quite dark enough. Um, so I'm gonna try uh, to do a mix of color of one part black, the two part gunmetal. And I'm gonna see how this works. And we're, we're experimenting here, we're having fun. All right, so I have my paint on my palette here and I've got about half as much black as I do uh, gunmetal. I don't want the black to overpower the gunmetal. It's a very strong color. It tends to drag stuff down to be black. Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit of water, I don't know, a drop of water, roughly the size of this black, and I'm just gonna work this in with the tip of my brush here to mix these two paints together. So I'm done mixing my uh, gunmetal uh, black here, my black metal. It's looking quite nice. I'm just gonna put a layer of this on and see how it looks. I'm just gonna rinse my brush because I don't wanna use all the paint that I've just loaded here. I'm gonna wipe it on my paper towel to make sure it's nice and clean. And I'm gonna put my, my palette off to the side and get working on doing the coverage. So loading my brush, I've just got a little bit of this black metal on here and I'm gonna come in and start going for the coverage. Uh, I'm gonna be cheating a little bit here though. I'm gonna be using a hair dryer to dry this paint faster. This is a really secret miniature technique. <laughs> when you're drying your miniatures like this, keep the uh, nozzle of the hair dryer and the miniature fairly far apart, about a foot, foot and a half. So I've let this guy dry under the hair dryer for about a minute and he's looking pretty decent. Um, there are a few areas though that I find that I've actually missed spots like underneath the hand and underneath the cloak here or the, the pauldron there. Um, I'm gonna go over with pure gunmetal now and do a coverage pass of that. So this is what he looks like with a second coat of pure gunmetal on top of him. And I think he's looking pretty great. That undercoat made it easier so that I could go and actually pick out the uh, areas that I needed to. And the overcoat was just reinforcing that. Uh, two thin coats is a mantra that a lot of people like to, to use when it comes to miniatures painting. And it really does pay off because it can fill in some of the spottiness that you get from the transparency of acrylic paints. Uh, next up, we're going to brush this guy with some silver to uh, dry brush him with some silver to really make these uh, raised areas pop. So I'm just gonna put a drop of silver down on my, on my work surface here. And we're not thinning this paint because just as I demonstrated earlier, I'm gonna go test this out on my hand here. As we can see, we're getting a little bit of build up there. We wanna be able to gradually build up areas so that we can control where the silver is being applied. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm just going to come in and work from top to bottom and dry brush just the kind of exposed raised areas and just gently drag the brush across the surface. And what that will do is it'll start building up silver and, and texture detail on the raised areas of your miniature while preserving the darker inner area um, and making it seem less bright and shiny by comparison. All right, so my dry brush of silver here hasn't been as impactful as possible as I would like. The metallics that I put down are just too similar and that's kind of a problem. But I have a solution and it's pretty easy. I'm gonna wash the areas of this, air of this miniature with a black wash and it's gonna go into all the recesses. It's also gonna be on some of the raised areas and it's gonna create a greater amount of contrast and I'm gonna come back over and re-dry brush it with silver. You're gonna see how it looks. So I'm gonna put two drops of uh, this this Vallejo uh, dark wash down. And I'm just gonna go and grab my brush that I've been using for all my metallics here. And I'm just gonna see if I can take it and apply it straight on. I'm gonna get 
a bunch of it off and I'm just gonna apply it directly on. Now, as you can see, it immediately darkens down that surface. So any areas that I find are a little too heavy or I don't want the wash to basically pool in those areas and cause a stain, kind of a rimmed area that's just artificially black, I'm gonna come in with just a touch of water and I'm gonna wick that wash away from that area and just kind of let it settle on the surface as a film rather than collect in giant pools. That's kind of my goal with this wash. It's more of a glaze than a wash. And I want the gravity to kind of pull the wash into naturally um, uh, natural reservoirs that form along uh, the geometry of this miniature. And then I'm gonna pull the wash from there. I'm gonna rinse my brush off here. As we can see, there's one reservoir right there. Naturally, it's flowing down the gauntlet. Take a little bit of water there, and I'm just gonna touch that, diluting the, the wash on the miniature itself, and then wicking the wash off with the capillary action for the brush. We don't wanna to go too dark, we just wanna darken down this just a little bit so when we come back with our silver, we can see a little bit more effect. All right, so I finished washing, and I'm not seeing any major coffee standing, and the entire tone of the miniature has been knocked down a peg, and it looks pretty great at this point. Now I'm gonna go back and redo that uh, silver highlight pass to really see if I can push some contrast into those edges and get them really singing with some really bright highlights. Um, so let's go give that another shot. So that's him uh, washed and dry brushed with another coat of silver and I think he's looking pretty good. I'm, I'm happy with that steel and the wash definitely helped out pick up some of the details in the uh, kind of sh and add some subtle shading to that steel. So I'm quite happy with this. Next I'm going to move on to doing the gold areas on this miniature. All right, so I've done the first big coverage coat for my large areas are gold, but I have some few little details in here like his medallions that I want to pick out. I'm going to come in here for this chain and I'm going to lightly trace just the top of the chain. I'm not going to try to go along the sides of it because if I do that, I'm just gonna put gold into the areas that I don't wanna put it in. I'm just gonna to try to trace it on the top. When doing micro details like this little medallion on his uh, robes here, what I find is useful is not to worry too much about the sides of the medallion that are facing down or away from the viewing angle. So he's being viewed from the top, obviously. So I'm gonna cover the top of the medallion here, but I'm not gonna bother going in and trying to paint in the sides of the medallion. And of course, I can't forget details like the hammer and thunderbolts on his shoulder pad. For these kind of details, I'm just going to let the side of the brush ride across the detail and kind of do all the work of picking it out for me. So I've done the first coat of gold on this guy and he's already looking a lot better. Um, I need to put a second coat of gold on him, but I also need to wait for this gold on his hammer to completely dry. So I'm going to go and swap uh, my efforts into painting the uh, robes of this guy purple because there's a lot of it and it'll take me a little bit of time. And by the time I'm done that, the hammer will be ready for a second coat. But because I'm doing this, I'm actually going to swap off my color uh, my paint water, because I'm not going to be working with metallics, I'm going to move my paint water off to the side so I don't use it. I'm just going to be working with purple, so I'm going to be using my chroma or my straight color water. For this paint, I'm going to get my brush nice and wet so that the uh, tip comes to a nice point. Uh, and I'm going to go and drag about half the size of a drop of water into this paint to kind of mix it up. And I'm going to pull paint into this paint, into this water, and hydrate it. Um, as I go along. And that feels like it's flowing pretty nice. Maybe a little bit more water, that's good. And as I'm working with this purple, I'll actually draw more of this non-moistened uh, paint into this water reservoir and add more water and kind of manage my consistency very closely. And that'll get me a very lovely flowing paint that doesn't really bead or flow. It doesn't want to do what water does, which is, this is like kind of a really thin paint there. I don't want that to happen where it beads. I want essentially the paint to spread and stay where I spread it, but have just enough beading and just enough flow to actually wick off the brush. So I'm gonna be working with this consistency of paint uh, for the next little bit. And we're gonna come in here and just throw this paint down. All right, so this is the first coat of purple that I put down, and it's looking quite nice, but it does need a second coat to kind of deal with some of the splotchiness. Um, I don't really like uh, how sporadic the coverage is in some areas. So I'm gonna hit this with the, the hair dryer to make sure it's fully cured, 
And then I'm gonna come back in and redo another coat of purple. Okay, so this is the second coat of purple down. And while it's drying, I'm gonna go and pick in a few more details in some places. Uh, mostly this parchment here and this kind of leather strapping there and the leather strapping on his, uh, his hammer. And I'm gonna start by putting down a nice coat of Beastie Brown in all of those areas as an undercoat. This is a little bit of an experiment because I want to make this parchment actually bone white. And I know that brown is a nice undercoat for bone because it allows you to essentially um, put highlights of the bone color in there. This is the eventual color I'm going to use for that, the bone white. Um, but I might be going a little too dark with this brown. We're going to find out. A few areas here where I put a little bit too much brown down and I'm just going to come in and wick that away with a wet brush. Um, but for these inner areas here, I'm gonna use a nice long brush in order to get into there. It's a little bit thinner. This one's a little too fat, unfortunately. So size one. Let's see if this guy will work okay. All right, so a little bit of hand gymnastics later, I've gotten this brown, <laughs> nice brown base coat down. This was just for reference. I believe I used a uh, beastie brown for this, a nice medium uh, kind of neutral brown. Um, I'm gonna go back and actually do some gold because I've missed the gold areas for the pommel of his uh, hammer here. I'm gonna do the second coat of gold on this guy. Do a little bit of touch up in some of the areas that I've painted over with the brown. Uh, and because we're gonna go and use our gold, I'm gonna go and change my water out for my metallic water. Bang, boom and I'm just gonna mix up some of this uh, gold and get it uh, put down. All right, so that's my second coat of gold on here. And again, I want it to fully dry before I put my third coat on because it's still a little patchy in some spots. Um, but while I'm waiting to do that, I'm gonna go and do a little bit more purple work. All right, so that's the last coat of purple that I'm gonna be putting down uh, until I get to the violet, uh, which is the highlight color. Uh, but before I get to that point, I wanna do one last blocking in of color, one last base coat. And that is gonna be that little crystal kind of tucked in beside his thigh. Uh, and that, I wanna be a nice bright blue. But I don't have a bright blue, I have a dark blue here, this ultramarine blue. So I'm gonna mix one part white and one part blue, and I'm gonna get a nice bright blue from that. All right, so that crystal is pretty much done. I put a mix of 50% uh, ultramarine blue and white on there as a base coat, and then I came in with a blue, uh, pure ultramarine blue, and did kind of the interior of the crystal, and then I did a little bit of edge highlighting in there with some pure white. And I didn't really dilute those paints all that much because I was more stippling with the brush and dragging the, the edge along the, uh, dragging the edge of the brush along the edge of the uh, paint surface there, like the highlight there, dragging it along the edge to kind of just barely kiss that edge and put a nice little rimmed highlight in there. Uh, moving on, uh, let's get this bone color down. The last thing you kind of heard me talk about um, in this video was putting uh, the bleached bone on this parchment area and kind of putting the coverage on there. Then I ran into a bit of a problem and I had to kind of stop recording and give this miniature a bit of a think because I ran into an issue. This polished gold is just too transparent and it wasn't going on in nice um, thick coats that were able to get good coverage on this hammer. And that was driving me nuts because I could just keep on putting more and more polished gold on, but it just wouldn't get the result that I wanted, unfortunately. They, they would just be patchy and blotchy and look weird. And I would uh, essentially kill all this nice uh, detail in here by putting all those coats of paint on. So I had to think of a new approach on how to do the gold for this miniature, and the solution I figured out was uh, to essentially mix in some of this bronze flesh tone from this set, and then mix it in with 50% uh, bronze flesh tone, 50% polished gold, or a one-to-one -one ratio. Do an undercoat of that. Uh, so it got rid of the, the gray that was kind of a problem and fixed the, the blotchiness from that. And then I started adding more and more polished gold to that mix and just went on top of that uh, with layer after layer. And I did about three layers. But because this gold is, becomes really blotchy and, and kind of patchy when I thin it too much, I had to go a little thicker than I'd like. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to save this by putting a nice deep wash on here, knocking it down a bunch and then dry brushing on the gold. Uh, for the wash for the gold, I'm going to use a equal parts uh, strong and light tone from Army Painter Quick Shade. So we're just going to put a drop in here of light tone and a drop of strong tone, a little bit more. I'm going to give this a good mix and see how that works out. 
We always want to test our tone, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a drag there. Looks like a very dark, nice brown, which should be quite good to really breathe some life and depth back into this kind of monochromatic, uh, incredible gold that I've kind of put down. So while I'm at it with this gold, I'm actually going to apply this uh, shade pass to the leather on this mini because I realized that it's essentially the perfect mix for both the gold and the leather. So I'm gonna come in here and just very heavily, I'm very, I'm gonna really slather this stuff on. And I'm gonna let that kind of self settle and self level and then come back and clean it up as I notice areas like that being a little bit too dark for my liking. Uh, while I'm doing all this tone work, I'm gonna do a little bit of work with the light tone as well. I'm just gonna put a little tiny drop of here just in the center there. And I'm not gonna dilute it or work with it or with anything else. I'm just gonna come in and kind of put it on this bone here. So when, with applying this tone for the parchment area, I was grabbing a little bit of tone, giving it an overall wash, and then I came back and applied a second coat by just tapping it into the recessed areas to push color into them. All right, so I've done a little bit more tone work on his crown here, and he's basically all finished, and all I need to do now is start building up the highlights uh, with my sponge here. And all I'm doing is I'm taking a little bit of watered paint, I'm using blue violet here from Model Color, I'm getting it uh, loaded on the sponge, and then I'm getting a bunch of it off of the sponge on my little kind of palette here, and then I'm just dragging it across the raised areas just like a dry brush technique. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna be a much smoother dry brush technique than if you used a uh, smoother and controllable dry brush technique than if you actually used a brush. And you're gonna be able to actually come in and selectively, depending on how you load the sponge you've got, um, make areas like the raised areas build up more paint than the kind of shallow areas um, in folds in the cloak. The trick is not to put too much paint on your sponge which is why I'm dabbing most of it off before I come back on here. I'm just gonna test it on my little glove here, make sure that I don't have too much. This is quite a heavy load for this technique. And I'm gonna come in here with the edge that I've done, and I'm just gonna kind of run along this edge here and build up some nice color using the nice, soft, um, kind of delicate texture of the sponge uh, to help me define these areas. And in areas that I can't really wipe, I'm gonna dab. A Little bit of a finicky technique, but if you can get it down, it can very, very quickly build up a lot of really, really good, crunchy contrast. You go to a hard, like here, you can wipe off some of that color and just blend it with a part of the sponge that doesn't have any tone on it. And if you really mess up, you can just go back over with your purple and cover that area up. And then just come back with your sponge and try again a very forgiving highlighting technique and very easy to learn. For delicate tight corners, like inside this little skirt here, I'm just using the corner of this brush and I'm being very, or not brush, but sponge. I'm being very, very careful to only apply it to the places where I think it needs to be applied so I don't contaminate any of the areas around it with uh, purple paint. Okie doke, this guy is done, and I'm quite happy with how he's turned out considering that I made a few mistakes with the gold on his hammer. Now, after the tone work, I think the gold is actually looking quite decent. Uh, it's not the best gold that I've done, but it's pretty good considering that I use this as a learning experience, and every miniature really is a learning experience. So if you make a mistake, and you can work to correct it, and if you don't make it perfect, finish it and move on, which is what I'm going to be doing with this guy. I need to finish the last part of him, which is the base. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of a dry brush and wash for gray for this tile. And then I'm going to use a product from Vallejo called Dark Earth and kind of stipple that into these recesses and these lowered areas. And that's going to essentially finish up this guy. All right, so it's been about an hour um, since I put down the ground texture and it's ready to be painted now that it's fully cured. It's actually quite tough now. Um, so I'm gonna put uh, some, slap some paint on here. I want it to be a little bit more earthy toned. So we're gonna grab our BC Brown. Instead of putting it on my wet palette, um, I'm gonna go and dump it right into uh, my tone palette here. 
and I'm gonna put just a little bit more. And then I'm gonna grab some water. I have a little pie pad here. I'm gonna put one drop of water in there. Doop, there we go. And then I'm gonna grab my, my brush here. It's a nice flat brush, mix that together. It might, some of the tone might rehydrate and get mixed back in, but all that's gonna add in is variance, so it's not too bad. And I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna start just layering it in. All right, so I've, uh, I've let this dry and it's looking pretty decent. Now all I've gotta do is uh, layer in some tone and some wash. I could come in with a straight black wash, but this might be a little too intense. So I'm gonna go grab my brown wash here. Uh, and this has been separated, so I gotta give this a really good shake, but this is gonna be combined with these two to create kind of a dark brown wash. One drop brown, let's say two drops, oh, that's three, that's fine. So three drops of brown wash, and I'm gonna get one drop black, because black is stronger than brown, so it's gonna kind of bias it. That's why I'm kind of making that ratio three to one. Then I'm gonna grab one of my brushes here and mix that together. And this looks very, very dark, but if I draw it out, you're gonna see, oh, very dark. Well, well, we'll give it a shot. We'll see how it looks. All right, so that wash is dried and it's actually looking quite lovely and nice. The only thing now left uh, to do for this essentially, I think is to give it a bit of a dry brush to pick up some of these details. So I'm gonna grab one of my larger brushes here, this guy here, and I'm actually gonna use um, this Beastie Brown and mix some, some boat white in there with the Beastie Brown. Uh, maybe about a, one-to-one -one ratio and it created a nice like tan nice kind of cream color and like magic this has brought out all the micro texture in this uh, texture paint and really made it pop looking much much better the only thing I want to do now is add a little bit of greenery to this I'm gonna do that with a grass tuff. So I've just put a drop of uh, PVA glue on my table here, and I'm just gonna dip this pre-made um, grass tuff in this PVA glue and then adhere it firmly to the table. And I'm gonna pick one of these smaller ones. I just got this guy here, and I'm gonna dip it in the, the PVA glue until it's covering the bottom. I want good coverage here. And PVA glue is nice because it dries clear, just gonna move it around a little bit. And I'm gonna just pick a spot and throw it down, tease it into place. And then I'm gonna grab a hobby knife and I'm just gonna very, very delicately uh, put some firm pressure on that grass pad. And this will make sure that it stays nice and secure. And that just adds a little bit of something to the base to make it feel a little bit more alive. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one done miniature. I'm just gonna clean up the base and put it on the turntable so you guys can see the final product. Uh, thank you for uh, watching this video. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on my techniques or have any suggestions on things I should try in the future, let me know down in the comments. Um, it'd be great if you subscribed. I really appreciate subscriptions because I feel like they, they give me motivation to keep on making tutorial videos like this. Um, and if you want to get in contact with me, well, you got the comments. Uh, let me know how uh, your own painting endeavors go and uh, have a good one. This is Carl signing out.